Welcome, uh, everybody, uh, libertarians from all over Latin America and Iberoamérica in general, from Spain, Argentina, Mexico, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Colombia, interested in finding this message uh, so different from Dr. Joe Jorgensen, a libertarian running for president in the United States. First of all, Dr. Jorgensen, thank you very much for uh, giving us this time. I think it's uh, very valuable that more people in Latin America get to know your important and different message. And I would like uh, by starting uh, with a horrible idea that has been uh, one of the uh, of the of the most terrible things that has happened in latin america every time we have democratic elections and it is people always thinking we have to vote for the lesser of two evils yes i don't like that guy but he's better than that guy yes. and this has uh, brought latin america to horrible dictatorships like the one of uh, hugo chavez in venezuela evo morales in bolivia and now it seems to me that it's happening in the united states people who say we don't like Donald Trump, uh, but you know, he's better than Biden, uh, or, or let's go for Biden. Uh, he's, he's not as bad as the other guy. Why is this logic uh, so cruel and so dangerous for a country? Well, first of all, there's not a lot of difference between the two. You know, so many people are saying uh, we got to reelect Trump because we can't let big government Democrats get elected. But if you look at the deficit, Trump increased the deficit at a faster rate than Obama did even before the pandemic. And he gave us the largest debt we've ever had. So when people say, well, I have to vote for um, Trump, my question is why? Is it because you wanted bigger government than what Obama gave you? Right. And that is uh, one of the things that it must be stressed, that there's not that much of a difference. People in Latin America often think Republicans is free market and conservative good morals, whereas the Democrats is socialism and communism with, uh, you know, all this uh, uh, openness in, in moral and individual rights. Could you explain to us why those differences are actually only superficial and not uh, and not true when we go to the specifics. Well, yeah, and you know, when I first joined the Libertarian Party um, many years ago, back in the 80s, I used to tell people, well, the, uh, the Libertarian Party gives you the best of both sides. You get the economic freedoms that uh, the Republicans give you and you get to own guns. And then on the other side, you get the social freedoms that Democrats give you. Uh, you, you get, you know, the, the individual freedom, the anti-war. And you can't say that anymore. I mean, now we've got Joe Biden and before him, Hillary Clinton, both huge war hawks. Uh, Joe Biden is the one who instigated the Iraqi war. And he was big on the uh, 1994 crime bill. Uh, so that's not the individual freedom. And oh, by the way, uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton both thought that gay marriage should still be illegal as recently as 2012. So we're not getting the freedoms from the Democratic Party. And I already mentioned that on the Republican side, we've got Trump spending more money than Obama did. Let's talk a little bit about imperialism and your views on uh, war and quotas, especially in the region of Latin America. We have this disease uh, in Latin America where there is a uh, American intervention, we complain, but then when there are disasters like the one going on in Venezuela, people say, oh, please invade, you know, and, and, and some uh, people who have been victims of socialism want military intervention in Venezuela, even though that they don't have a further plan on how to rebuild Venezuela. So what are your stance on, on, uh, on this vision that the United States has to be the police of the world? Well, two things. First of all, it costs a lot of money. And because we are in 150 different countries around the world, and we spend more on military than the next seven countries combined. And I've jokingly said, you know, people say how great France is because they get five week vacations. Well, maybe we would get five week vacations, too, if we didn't have to support France's military and all these other countries. But, you know, if it were the money, it would be bad enough. But it's even worse than that. It's making us less safe. And what's ironic is that the job of the uh, military is to protect us, to make us more safe, not less safe. And all we have to do is look at 9-11 to see how being 
over there made us less safe. Now, let me quickly add, we can't stop every madman from flying planes into buildings. However, we just made it easier for bin Laden to recruit people because since we were over there at the time, bin Laden just pointed to our troops and said, look, they said they would be here temporarily. They're still here. They said they'd be gone by this date. They lied. They're still here past that date. And look, they're trying to take over our laws, our religion. So we've got to get them. We got to get rid of them. Now, if we hadn't been over there, it wouldn't have looked like we were trying to take over. So we just made it easier for bin Laden to recruit everybody. And, and here is uh, one of the things that you have stressed about uh, the creation of the United States, the original vision of the founding fathers, because sometimes when people think of libertarian ideas, it's like, well, yeah, but they're too radical. Why would I give my bow to Joe if she's not going to win? Yeah, your ideas might be good, but they're not, they're, they're not going to win. When in fact, libertarian ideas are way more congruent with the original idea that the founding fathers created. And you have stressed that there is a need to get back to the constitution, to go back to those principles, which are the ones that made the United States the, more, the most prosperous country in the planet, and which is the reason why so many Latin Americans, in fact, 60 million of them, legal and illegally, have made the US their home. Yeah, well, to all the people who think that libertarianism is extremist or are extremists, I would say the Democrats and Republicans are the extremists. I would say it's extreme to be spending over half of our money and not letting us spend our own money. I would say it's extreme to have everybody in the country choose one retirement system that we all have to agree on. I would say it's very extreme that we've got a 25 to 27 trillion dollar debt. And last, I would say it's extreme for us to be in 150 different countries around the world. And I would like to mention that if I become president, I, I my first act would be to turn America into one giant Switzerland, armed and neutral. We absolutely have to protect our shores. We need a well-trained military, but we shouldn't be everywhere else around the world. It just makes us look like bullies. And I would say that's being extremist. Uh, let's talk about uh, drug policy. Uh, one of the denials in Latin America is the fact that because we have drug cartels that actually become communist parties, like the, the case of FARC in Colombia is not only the biggest drug cartel, it's also now a communist party after being a, a Marxist guerrilla that committed horrible crimes. And there is no position either in the Republican Party nor the Democratic Party to talk about the failure on war on drugs and it's costing uh, millions of dollars for Latin America and, and, and let alone the lives that have been lost. What would be your approach uh, to this specific subject that involves both the United States and Latin America? Well, the questions I've been going around asking American voters is when is the last time you heard of a liquor store owner trying to push gin onto high school students? Or when's the last time you heard of a vodka addict? breaking into houses in order to support a vodka habit? And when's the last time you heard of two liquor store owners having a shootout over the best corner? What we have right now is not a drug problem. What we have is a prohibition problem. So we're right back where we were in the 1920s. In the 1920s, we had alcohol prohibition. So we had Al Capone in the streets of Chicago with all the shootouts, innocent people being killed. And now we have the same thing all over again, except instead of alcohol, it's, it's drugs. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't use drugs. You know, I think they're wrong. So the drug policy doesn't affect me. But I say it does. And by the way, I don't use drugs either. Well, well, actually, my drug of choice is bourbon. And um, I would suggest that, first of all, bourbon is even more dangerous than marijuana. Why are we not letting people use marijuana? But even the more dangerous drugs, you want them decriminalized so that we can get rid of the problems. And one last quick thing, I was on a podcast in which somebody said, well, it's fine with me if you want to mar uh, legalize marijuana, but not meth. And, I, you know, and he said because he'd be concerned that his next door neighbor might be running a meth house and how it would have toxic substances and it'd be dangerous for the children. And people have bought meth houses and then they've had to clean it up.
Well, when's the last time you heard of anybody making bathtub gin in their houses? They don't have to because alcohol is legal. I would much rather have Philip Morris or Seagram's or one of those other companies making meth away from our homes so we don't have to worry about a drug manufacturer or a drug dealer in our house next year. How do you ambition uh, the United States going into decriminalizing drugs and having uh, legal production of these substances versus the violent cartels that are in place uh, in Mexico, Colombia, and, and all over Central America? Well, I would just decriminalize them in one fell swoop as president. I, um, I've been told I can do that through the attorney general at the national level. Now, keep in mind, if it's legal, then people in our country don't have to smuggle using the dangerous drug cartels. They could go to law-abiding companies like Philip Morris and Seagram 7. And that's the other problem that we have is that uh, with with all the drugs, all it's doing is putting money into the gangs, into the cartels, and that's how we have such violence going on in our city streets, because they police themselves, usually using violence with shootouts. Uh, another concern of the few things that get about your campaign in Latin America is uh, regarding uh, socialism of the 21st century, uh, which has polluted more than 15 countries of, of Latin America with these uh, terrible policies. The most extreme cases, of course, being Venezuela. Cuba and Nicaragua and so sense of Venezuela are concerned of what you have spoken about uh, taking down some of the uh, that are in place right now for from the US government okay I'm sorry I it, it, it froze there for just a minute were you talking about the environment uh, no, sorry. Talking about yeah, the uh, in, uh, the quotas and the restrictions oh. that the U.S. government has implemented in Venezuela. Yeah, no, I want to freely trade across the borders. You know, there's a saying that when goods cross borders, troops don't have to. And I'd like to point out to anyone out there who doesn't like that idea that the reason, or many historians say that the reason Japan bombed us in World War II was because we had these tariffs and we had these trade wars. And by the way, notice the word war is even in there. So they bombed us and we got into World War II. Well, Japan's not going to bomb us now because of all the Toyotas and Hondas that we buy from them, uh, because you tend to not bomb your best customer. So I want to be good trading partners with everybody around the world, because first of all, um, again, that's the way to get along with countries, because then you're, you don't, you know, you tend to not be at war with your good customers. And secondly, because that just helps the economy, that helps uh, people be able to buy cheaper products if they want uh, for a cheaper price. And uh, why not have, you know, it, it's just immoral to tell people that they can't trade what they've made or their services to somebody else. We own it. We should be able to trade with anybody we like. And talking about free trade, which is absolute uh, uh, trade with no barriers, with no privileges, there is the notion, of course, in Latin America that the United States is the beacon of absolute free market capitalism, when in fact now you have lobbies, you have tariffs, you have a lot of regulation that makes it impossible for a true free market to exist in the United States. But of course, compared to our mercantilist and socialist economies, the United States is better, and that's why a lot of Latin America Americans migrate there. So what would be oh, your vision? Oh, I just wanted to, if you don't mind my interrupting, I read a recent yeah. study that we are number 16 in economic freedom around the world. I, I don't know the countries ahead of us, but no, we're not the, we're not the freest. We're number 16. Yeah, and that's good to remember. And, and, and on that point, what, what would be your vision to get back to a real free market economy for the United States? Well, we just have to open up the borders to free trade. And, you know, we keep hearing about these deals out there, these uh, trade deals where we've got free trade. Well, if you have to have some kind of document, if you have to have some kind of deal written out, then it must not be free trade because free trade doesn't need a deal. A free trade doesn't need a treaty. Free trade is free trade. You simply get to buy and sell with whoever you like. 
Now let's talk about uh, uh, also healthcare and this welfare. Uh, not, of course, it's also uh, why Latin America is always uh, trying again and again with socialism. And now they call it socialism of the 21st century. Uh, the healthcare systems uh, are a disaster in, in, in Latin America. And sometimes it is seen that in the United States, since the Obamacare, the situation got better. Could you talk to us about your alternative healthcare? Yes. Well, if there's one message that I could get to every single American voter, it's that we do not have a free market system. So many politicians are saying, well, the free market didn't work, so we'll have to go to single payer. But a single payer system is atrocious. Uh, we've seen people um, in Great Britain and Canada on long waiting lists and literally dying on waiting lists. And when I hear a politician say we need Medicare for all, what I think is VA hospital for all. And these the VA hospital is unacceptable for anyone, especially uh, the people who are willing to sacrifice their lives for our country. And all I do is point towards the two, two somewhat free market fields that we have in our country, which are cosmetic surgery and uh, LASIK surgery, because people pay for those out of their own pocket. And what we've seen is either a price reduction or at least uh, not as big of an increase. So with LASIK surgery, um, in a period recently ending, um, over a 20 year period, the prices went down 70%, while all other healthcare went up 125%. So we need to get competition in there so that people are competing for our business. The same way grocery stores and gas stations and car manufacturers and computer dealers compete. You know, they try to offer the best price um, or, you know, phones or phone service. They try to offer the best price with the best quality so that we go to them. We don't have that competition in healthcare. And if we did, we would see prices go down dramatically. Dr. Jorgensen, let's talk about education as well. The prices of the uh, universities in the United States who are uh, more and more uh, against the ideas of free market and freedom of expression, and they cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And some people blame free market for these uh, ludicrous prices. Could you explain to us what, what is your approach and, and, and your proposal for uh, education in the United States? Well, education is a local issue. It should be decided among parents, teachers, and students. And I, as president, I would just leave it up to the states and the localities. The president should not be involved with education. Uh, if you look around the country, different places have different needs. The needs of rural Appalachia, much different than downtown New York City, much different from California. Let's let each of the groups decide on their own what they need instead of the president overseeing everybody. And can I, if you don't mind, I'd like to extend this because yes. I think I think education is a great example to explain what the difference is between Democrats and Republicans on one side and libertarians on the other side. So what we have right now with education, uh, with Democrats and Republicans, is you have to battle it out to get the kind of education you want for your child. So let's say you want to send your kid to a school with prayer, and let's say your neighbor doesn't. What you have to do right now is you each pick your own candidates, you uh, put out yard signs, get all your friends to vote, donate money, and then on election day, one of you is going to win and one of you is going to lose. And it's going to be one size fits all and somebody's going to be unhappy. The the um, libertarian way is you get to keep your resources. And if you want to send your kid to a school with prayer, you can. You're voting with your dollars every day. If your neighbor wants to send his kid to a school without prayer, then he can. And we can get along much better. And I think that's one of the reasons why we are so polarized, why we're so at odds with each other, because we're all trying to vote on one size for all of us to do. We're all voting on everybody having the same retirement with social security, voting on the same health care for everybody, voting on whether or not we have vaccines, whether or not we wear masks. I mean, it's getting as bad as pretty soon we'll all be voting on, are we all going to be vegetarians? Or are we all going to eat steak? Uh, we're just not right. We're just not going to get along if we all have to vote and agree on everything because we're not. We're individuals and we should be able to make our own decisions and we can make decisions better than any bureaucrat or lobbyist in Washington can.
Dr. Jorgensen, uh, another uh, there is the notion in America that Democrats are more immigrant friendly, although Obama deported more people back home than the Bush administrations. And there's the notion that Republicans just don't want to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> what is your stance on immigration? Well, first of all, three of my four grandparents are immigrants to this country. They came over before immigration was shut down in the 1920s. So they came more than the teens. So before the 1920s, we had pretty much open immigration. And not only was it fine, but it made our country competitive. It brought over all sorts of people with new ideas, people who wanted to work hard, people who wanted to make a better life for themselves. And I I want to see more of that again. So I, I don't think we should just open up our borders to help the people coming in. I think we should open up our borders to help our country because the GDP will go up, we'll have more innovation, more ideas. And besides, a lot of people are saying, you know, uh, you, you don't want to open up the borders because of crime, but the statistics just don't bear in it. Uh, if you look at people here, people born on foreign soil commit fewer crimes per capita than people born on American soil. Uh, there's uh, another issue that I want wanted to discuss Dr. Jorgensen because as I tell you, there are uh, unfortunately two or three things that Latin Americans hear about you and then there's like a, a huge scandal and that's why I wanted to make this interview. One of this is uh, your stance with Black Lives Matter. And it turns out that some of the leaders of Black Lives Matter uh, took photographs and were in meetings with the communist Chavista regime leaders. So everybody was like, no, Black Lives Matter is then uh, this communist movement and whoever supports said it's on that side of the spectrum and of course this was um, uh, supported with the uh, uh, evidence that there was a lot of uh, violation to private property riots and not uh, a, a peaceful movement per se could you talk a little bit about what was your stance with black lives matter Yes, I'm surprised to see that, that there were pictures of me in meetings. That doesn't make sense. I've never met with anyone from the National Party. And the libertarian stance is completely opposite from the Black Lives Matter national movement because they are Marxists. They want bigger government. I want smaller government. Now, let me quickly add, I'm happy to talk with Black Lives Matter. And I, I've spoken with at least one local uh, person uh, in another state because we agree on the problems. We agree that we've got to end qualified immunity. We've got to end no-knock rates. We've got to end the racist and destructive war on drugs. The problem is that uh, that Black Lives Matter thinks that the answer is bigger government. And that breaks my heart because government is what gave them the problems to begin with. You shouldn't go to the same people who are causing the problem. That's why we need smaller government. But I'm hoping that, you know, if, 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 if any Black Lives Matter people are listening and uh, th that, you know, we can have a conversation and I can explain how it's government that is actually hurting them, not helping them. And as far as property destruction, I'm absolutely for peaceful protesting. And, and in the beginning, we did have a lot of peaceful protests and uh, there were just a few opportunists who were hijacking the movement, you know, like Antifa. So I'm absolutely against the arson, burglary, vandalism, and those people who are caught should be um, pro prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I am so glad that you clarified this because uh, there's a lot of fake news going around uh, of, of things that you've said about Black Lives Matter, especially in Latin America, which I think is part of, you know, a, a dirty war that it's been going on against the Libertarian Party. And in your experience and all these years that you've been part of the Libertarian movement, do you think that now you are having more voice and more attention because people are finally understanding the mistakes? mistakes of both the Republican and the Democratic side, and what lessons can be drawn from the libertarian movement in the United States that is now getting more attention 
for the libertarian movements that are starting in Latin America, like Javier Milei in Argentina with Jose Luis Esper, or uh, the Partido Libertario in Spain, who are trying to push a libertarian agenda that steps away from the right wing and does its own thing. You make an excellent point. When I was running for vice president, I, I was a vice presidential candidate in 1996. And what I would go around telling people how government's too big, our deficit's too big, our debt's too big, we've got to get government smaller. People didn't understand. They, you know, their lives were going along fine. And they said, well, government doesn't seem too big to me. But now, especially with the coronavirus, people are going, wait, what do you mean you're putting me under house arrest where I can't go to my job? You know, what do you mean you're going to force me to wear a mask? What do you mean we can't have more than three people out on the sidewalk at a time? So now people understand how government is getting into their everyday lives. So now I don't have to go around and explain how, how you know, government is taking away our freedoms. They can see that. And so, you know, that's really sad that it took a pandemic pandemic to do that. Um, however, people are seeing that, yes, government is taking away too many of our decisions. If you would have been in charge uh, right now in the White House during the pandemic, what would have been your stance? The biggest difference, and, and Trump, this is Trump's biggest mistake, is not getting rid of the FDA obstacles. Now, let me first point out that when people ask me why I'm running for president, I tell them because government is too big, too bossy, too nosy, too intrusive. But the worst part is they usually end up hurting the very people they try to help. So that's the say that that's exactly what's going on with the FDA. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is supposed to be there to protect us, protect us from bad drugs. But what they did is they prevented us from getting testing. Thanks to the FDA and the CDC, while there were dozens of testing kits out there we could have used uh, to see if we tested positive or not. Instead, they only allowed us to use two of them from around the world. So if you look at like South Korea, they jumped ahead in testing and they were able to contain the spread without any lockdown. And, and they, they diagnosed their first case within about a day of our first case. Now, what happened to us? Uh, President Trump, or uh, yeah, President Trump stood there on stage with Dr. Fauci and said, if you don't have symptoms, don't get tested. But they knew at the time that at least half the people with the virus didn't have any symptoms at all. So that's when you should get tested because you could go around and spread it and 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 not know it. So what president should have done was Emergency Powers Act, uh, let all these tests come into our country, find out who has the virus, who doesn't. That way, those of us who don't have the virus can go to work and then we don't have to lose the tens of millions of jobs that we lost. Dr. Jorgensen, thank you so very much for your time. I know that you have a very tight schedule and I hope that with this interview, more people get to think because they think, well, maybe, you know, I have to vote for either or the lesser of two evils. When in fact, if everybody thinks that, then always right. the same option wins. But if everybody becomes an individual and says, no, this is my vote, and these are the ideas that make more sense and more people start doing that, then situations can change. And I really uh, hope that you get uh, to the White House because it would be great news for Latin America to finally have uh, someone in the United States that is for free trade, individual liberties, uh, is, is stopping ignoring the, the bigger issues of the war on drugs and immigration. So thank you very much and, uh, and, and good luck. Well, and I'd like to point out that about 40 million Americans do lean libertarian. And if everybody who leaned libertarian voted for me, we could win in a landslide. And 75% of our volunteers are from outside the party. So it shows that so many people don't like the system. They know the old system is broken. And my website is joe20.com, jo20.com. And last, I just wanted to mention that last year I visited Spain and Portugal for the first time ever. It's the first 
time I've ever gone to Europe and I chose Spain and Portugal and I just enjoyed myself so much. And I loved Madrid where everybody stays up really late. I'm a night owl, so that's <laughs> great. I loved it. I'm glad you did. Thank you, Dr. Jorgensen. Uh, follow her and her campaign. And don't forget to share this interview because everyone should uh, listen to Dr. Jorgensen before voting. Thank, Thank you. you.